Hello everyone, this is Dr. Ergen, the Sugar MD, and welcome to Ask Dr. Ergen Friday, where I take real questions from people just like you and give you rapid, no BS answers about diabetes, blood sugar, and hormones. Today, we are doing 10 rapid fire questions, like why is my blood sugar high in the morning? Does metformin damage kidneys? Should I fear insulin shots? Do GLP-1 medications like Ozempic and Munjaro replace my diet? If you like this format, hit like and drop your question in the comments. And you might be in the next video. All right, so let's jump in. Question number one, why is my fasting blood sugar high in the morning? And this is what they said in their comment on YouTube. Dr. Ergen, my blood sugar is always high in the morning, even when I don't eat anything at night. Why is my sugar high when I wake up? Great question. And this is probably the number one complaint that I hear. And there are three main reasons. Number one is dawn phenomenon. Around 3 to 8 a.m., your body starts preparing to wake up, right? Hormones like cortisol, growth hormone, and adrenaline rise. And these hormones tell your liver, hey, give us some fuel. Now, the liver dumps glucose into your bloodstream, so you wake up with fuel. That's good for non-diabetic, but if you have diabetes or insulin resistance, you cannot clear that sugar as well. So your fasting sugar is typically high for that reason. Even if it was much better at 3 o'clock in the morning, at 8 o'clock, it may be high by that time. Now, liver glucose dump is important because even if you don't eat, your liver acts like, hey, let me help you survive the night so releases that storage glycogen into your blood and if your insulin is weak and you are insulin resistant that sugar is just gonna stay high and we have other videos to talk to tackle how to beat that dawn phenomenon now not always last night's food is a problem right so people blame their dinner but they say doc you know i ate nothing after 6 p.m it's not always the last meal. It is often your hormones, your liver, and your insulin resistance. So you can have perfect dinner and still have crappy morning numbers sometimes. And the key takeaway is high morning sugar is usually a hormone problem, a liver issue, not just you ate too much issue. And short advice for the viewers is that don't just starve at night out of guilt. Talk to your doctor about it. Timing of medications, your breakfast, possible basal insulin adjustments or even mealtime adjustments for the insulin if you're on insulin or you know adding supplements or medications to reduce that liver glucose output now question number two why does walking drop my blood sugar so fast so that's exactly what they asked so what they said that every time I walk after a meal my blood sugar drops really fast why does walking work so well, even sometimes too well? Well, because your muscles are magic, right? Here's what happens in simple terms. Muscles act like a sponge. So when you move, your muscles open up the GLUT4 channels. And a translation for that is the doors open on your muscle cells and glucose is sucked in. The best part, this happens even with less insulin. Number two, less reliance on insulin so normally your body needs insulin to push sugar into the cells right but with muscle contraction like walking cycling etc your body can pull sugar in without needing a big insulin spike and three why it drops fast well because big meal causes big blood sugar rises you walk 10 to 20 minutes and muscles start pulling glucose out of your blood so your CGM or your finger stick shows that beautiful drop. And here's a practical tip. If you can, do 10 to 15 minutes of walking after meals. Not a marathon, just consistent, gentle movement. It is one of the cheapest, safest medications for diabetes. And let's take the third question. Does metformin damage kidneys? Now, that question is common. I keep hearing it, and uh, I keep hearing that the metformin is bad for your kidneys. Does metformin damage kidneys, they're asking. Short answer, no, not directly. Metformin does not damage your healthy kidneys. 
But if you have other issues going on, metformin can be dangerous in kidney disease. Metformin is not necessarily a kidney poison. It's just that does not physically damage the kidney tissue as far as we know. It just can accumulate when you have kidney disease. So we recommend people to consider using alternatives such as berberine in those cases. So why people get confused? Well, because we lower the metformin dose as doctors, right? When kidney function is low and that kidney function go down as you age, especially with diabetes. So we have to adjust your medications and one of them is, is the metformin. And patients look at their kidneys and they're like, hey, my kidney is down, I'm on metformin, doctor's cutting on the metformin. So it must be the metformin causing the damage. But it's actually because metformin can build up. In rare cases, it can cause lactic acidosis. So that's why doctors are often careful when a GFR is low. There are some studies out there that can potentially affect kidney function, but that's not so much proven as much as the safety data. So the reality check is that diabetes itself is what destroys your kidneys over time. Metformin helps some people. It doesn't always help. It has a lot of side effects. We talked about this a lot in the past. But if that is what you can afford, just don't think that you are killing your kidneys just being on metformin. Should I be on metformin with my current kidney function? Well, I would say just because you have a little bit lower kidney function doesn't mean that you have to stop it right away. You can reduce the dose. You can add on some berberine like sugar and be super berberine, but you don't have to freak out and stop it altogether. Now, if you stopped it and your blood sugar didn't change, maybe you didn't need it to begin with. So that's fine. The trial and error is okay as well, as long as you're in consultation with your doctor. And question number four. So why do I crash at 3 p.m.? Right? So viewer is asking every day around 3 p.m. I hit a wall like tired, hungry, shaky, sometimes a brain fog. What's going on, doc, right? The 3 p.m. crash is super common. And usually there are three players. Number one is high insulin after lunch. So big lunch means big carbs, big spikes, and your body may overshoot, pushing too much sugar into the cells and too much insulin off, obviously, to do that. But the result is blood sugar spikes and comes down very fast and then that causes like low sugar or tired and hungry and irritable. Secondly, cortisol dip, right? Cortisol is higher in the morning, then drops later in the day. So when cortisol dips and blood sugar is sliding down, you will feel sleepy and weak. And number three is adrenal and stress dysregulation. So if you're chronically stressed or having poor sleep, your adrenal rhythm gets messed up. So your cortisol can drop a lot faster than it should. So normally cortisol level starts coming down slowly over day and by nighttime you have almost nothing and that makes you tired. But if you're running out of cortisol so early, then you will have that energy problem and your energy will be unstable. Here are some fixed ideas. Don't load your lunch with just carbs plus bread and plus soda, right? So add protein, right? Add fat, add fiber so the sugar release is a lot slower. And a short walk after lunch is not a bad idea. Evaluate your sleep, your stress, your caffeine habits too. And question number five, should I fear insulin shots? So someone says, doc, I'm terrified of starting insulin. Does going on insulin mean I failed? And I hear this daily. Let me be blunt. You should fear uncontrolled diabetes and uncontrolled blood sugars, not the insulin itself. If your body is not making insulin anymore, which is measurable, then what are you going to do, right? So just wait to die with high blood sugars? No. Insulin is a tool, not a punishment. Insulin is just a hormone that your pancreas either does not make enough of and your body just doesn't respond well enough to. So sometimes you can use temporarily or sometimes permanently depending on your situation. Using insulin is like wearing glasses. It's a tool to help you function, not a moral failure. What you should really fear is your blindness, your kidney failure, amputations, heart attacks. Those come from years of high sugar, not the insulin shot itself. So how to think about it? Sometimes we use insulin temporarily, right? To get things under control. I tell patients, look, if your blood sugar is running 400, nothing is gonna work because your engine is flooded, your liver is out of control. We have to use that insulin for just a couple of weeks maybe to get things under control. Once the flood is down, once the storm is gone, then we can stop the insulin and let your body do its work. 
The goal is really the good numbers, good life, not avoiding a needle at all costs. That's all psychological. Question number six, why does stress spike my blood sugar, right? So a viewer said, hey, I checked my blood sugar when I was super stressed and it was high, even though I didn't even eat because when I stressed out, I don't eat, not like the other people. How does stress raise blood sugar? Well, stress can spike your blood sugar without a single carb in your mouth. Why? Because of the stress hormones. So when you're stressed, your body releases cortisol and adrenaline. And your brain thinks you're in danger. Fight or flight, right? So liver dumps glucose. And cortisol says to your liver, so release sugar now. This person needs energy to survive. And liver dumps glucose into your bloodstream. And then your insulin resistance goes up, right? Stress hormones actually makes your cells more insulin resistant. So not only is there more sugar, but your body is worse at using it. And the practical tips are deep breathing, short walks, stretching, prayer, meditation, not fluffy. I mean, these literally change your hormones. Don't just chase stress spikes with more meds. Work on the stress itself. Question number seven, do GLP-1 medications replace diet, like your Ozempic, your Monjaro, right? Some people feel so good on them. They're like, yeah, this changed my life. Now my blood sugars are so much better. I can eat whatever I want. So here's the question, the real question. I just started a GLP-1 shot for weight loss. Does this mean that I don't have to worry about my diet as much? Well, the short answer is absolutely not. What GLP-1s actually do is that they reduce your appetite, they slow your stomach emptying and help your pancreas release insulin in a smarter way. They make it easier to eat less and control cravings. And what they do not do is that they don't fix your entire lifestyle. They don't cure insulin resistance by themselves. A lot of people lose a lot of muscle on them, right? A lot of people lose bone on them. Uh, there are a lot of issues with them if you're not incorporating your lifestyle and your diet is not right. So if you're not eating enough protein, if you're not exercising, you're not going to win. You will lose weight, but that doesn't mean that that's a healthy weight loss. They don't protect you if you keep abusing sugar and junk on the long term. Some people, you know, reduce their overall calories, but they still eat junk. And best way to use them is use the medication as a window of opportunity, right? So while your appetite is lower, you know, make sure to clean up your diet and learn some new habits, maybe some new diet, maybe some new foods and add movement. So, so if you stop that medication one day, you don't gain everything back. Question number eight, why am I hungry after eating? And the viewer said, I just ate, but I'm still hungry an hour later. Why am I always hungry even after meals? Well, the answer is, this is usually a hormone plus macro combo problem. Now, high insulin is a problem, right? So when you have big carb heavy meal, your insulin shoots up and sugar drops fast after that. Your brain thinks that you're starving because of the drop in the blood sugar. And the result is you feel hungry way too soon. And the second is low protein and low fiber and low fat. If your meal is mostly bread, rice, pasta, sweets with little protein or fiber, well, you get the fast rise and a fast crash and a fast hunger. And the stress hormones, right? Cortisol and poor sleep can actually mess with ghrelin and leptin, your hunger and fullness hormones. So your hunger signals are louder and less accurate in any case. So how to fix it? Well, you got to add protein to your meals like eggs, fish, meat, Greek yogurt, tofu, add fiber like vegetables, salads, beans, if tolerated, and reduce the pure sugar and white carbs and work on sleep and stress, not just calories. Question number nine, is keto required to control diabetes or is keto necessary? And the viewer said, do I have to go keto to control my diabetes? Everyone online says keto is the only way. The answer, no. Keto is not required for everyone. Keto can help some people. Like very low carb can help, you know, rapidly drop the blood sugar. And some people like that quick results. And some people feel great on it too and lose weight quickly. But it's not for everyone. So some people feel tired and constipated and stressed 
um, and they cannot get out of it like they say you could. And it can be hard to sustain long term as well because of everything going on around them. So not ideal for certain medical conditions unless closely supervised. So don't make a drastic diet change without discussing with your doctor. But what actually matters is reducing overall carb load, especially refined carbs and sugar, increasing your protein, fiber, and healthy fats. You can do Mediterranean, you can do it low carb, um, and if you are very active, you can do moderate carbs, but a lot of patterns will work. The best diet is the one that controls your blood sugar, nourishes you, and you can stick with for years, not just for so weeks or months because you got to have a life. And question number 10, that's the last question. Why is weight loss so damn slow? <laughs> well, I hear that a lot. So like someone says, I'm eating better and moving more, but my weight is barely dropping. Why is weight loss is so damn slow? Well, the answer is because your weight follows your hormones, not just your willpower. So when you have high insulin levels, you're in the fat storage mode. If your insulin is constantly high from frequent snacking or carbs, etc., in the past, your body hangs on to fat even if you're trying hard. And secondly, cortisol, right? The stress. The chronic stress causes high cortisol that causes belly fat. So your body thinks it is in survival mode and refuses to let go. And number three, thyroid and other hormones. So low thyroid your low sex hormone, uh, sleep apnea, etc., all can slow the process. And think about timeline, right? There's a reality. You didn't gain these weight or this weight in two weeks. You won't lose it in two weeks either. So if you're losing 0 0.5 to 1 pound per week over months, it's actually pretty good. What to focus on instead is not the scale only, but better blood sugar, better energy, better sleep, and inches lost, not just the pounds. All right, that was the 10 rapid fire questions for Ask Dr. Ergen Friday. So I'll see you next Friday and make sure you attend the Myth Monday, Lab Wednesday, and Ask Dr. Ergen Friday. Talk to you later.